A young man was being tempted to desert his vocation. He had known for some time that he was called to be religious, but his attachment to the things of earth, extravagant dress, the latest fashions and perfumes, reading of novels and romances, an immoderate fondness of company, was threatening to snuff out God's call. However, despite his worldly attachments, this young man possessed definite sparks of piety, including a fervent devotion to the passion of Christ and to his Immaculate Virgin Mother. Often, after Holy Communion, he would be seen making his thanksgiving in tears. One close to him wrote that it was as if he were pondering over some great thought and maturing with God some great design. God wished to make this great design clear to the young man. And so, by the providence of God, a great sickness came over the boy, which threatened his life. In desperation, the boy begged Our Lady to cure him, promising, if she did, that he would become a religious. He was speedily cured. However, as so often happens when we receive a grace, the youth let it slip through his fingers. He made no attempt to join religious life. A few years later, another sickness jeopardized his health. Again, he begged the Lord to cure him, renewing his promise to become a religious. The cure was granted, and this time he applied to the nearby Jesuits, seeking permission to enter. It was granted him, but as time went by, he delayed his pro- to fulfill his promise until he was once again hypnotized by the world and its pleasures. It was not that he was deliberately rejecting his vocation, but he was like, as one of his biographers puts it, one who, waking from sleep and remembering the call of duty, instead of rising instantly, gives way to a sloth, is overcome by drowsiness, and falls asleep again. The saint's vocation was on the line. Now, in the cathedral of Spoleto, there was an ancient image of the mother of God, which was held in great veneration by the people. On the octave day of the Assumption, the townspeople were carrying the icon of Our Lady in procession. The young man, who God was trying to bring to religious life, was standing in the crowd. When he looked up at the picture, Mary looked right at him. She gave him a look that filled his heart with sorrow, remorse, and compunction. And she said directly to his soul, Why? Thou art not made for this world. What art thou doing in this world? Hasten, become a religious. This young man was instantly cured of all sloth, and from that moment forward was determined to become a religious. For the young man, the question was now finalized. He was intent on joining the Passionist Order, founded in 1725 by St. Paul of the Cross. However, as our Lord said, a man's enemies will be they... Of his own household. The father of this youth, apart from being an exceptional lawyer, was also a very devout man. He would spend one hour in the morning performing various spiritual exercises before attending Holy Mass. However, when Signor Pacenti, the boy's father, heard that his son was going to join religious life, he simply laughed. You want to be a religious, my son? Your life has been one of vanity and pleasure. See, my dear boy, your vocation is nothing but a sudden notion. No sooner has the fancy struck you than you want to run off somewhere. My son, that will never do. But his son possessed a determination characteristic of the saints, and he soon set out to do God's bidding. On his journey to the Passionist with his brother, Father Aloysius, a Dominican priest, he stopped at several of his relatives' homes. They all vehemently protested against his vocation, begging him to give up the idea. But the young man knew that he had received a singular grace from God, and if he rejected it, there might be no second chance. Finally, he arrived at the Passionist Novitiate House, soon after making a general confession and receiving the Most Blessed Sacrament. He began his religious life. When he became a novice, his name was changed from Francis Placenti to Gabriel of the Sorrowful Mother. The, the rest of St. Gabriel of the Sorrowful Mother's life 
can only be described as a quick journey to the very heights of holiness. In just five years of religious life, he attained perfection. In his novitiate year, he completely detached himself from the world and all its enjoyments, which had previously ensnared him. On September 22nd, 1857, he took his vows. Those present said that it looked like an angel was in his place. On this occasion, he wrote to his father, through the grace of God and the protection of Our Lady of Sorrows, and to my unspeakable joy, my desires have been fulfilled, and I have made my holy profession. Such a grace can never be valued adequately, and therefore, as I have been favored by Almighty God with such a privilege, I feel bound by an ever-increasing obligation to correspond thereto. And Gabriel did respond. The remaining years of his life were lived out with an almost angelic fervor. He used to say to himself, Corde magno et anima volent, with the great and the willing mind. St. Gabriel was a man. This angelic youth studied to become a priest in Isola near Penn. This pure boy had an excellent mind and a sharp intellect. And so he rapidly advanced in his studies. In fact, it is said that his excellent academic progress was only beaten by his swift spiritual progress. Gabriel, it seemed, would become a model priest. During his stay in Isola, a well-known incident in his life occurred. One day, he saw a group of 20 armed men, thugs, from the nearby army of Giuseppe Gardibaldi. They had come to pillage the village. Those inside the village were hiding, hoping to avoid the conflict. St. Gabriel was not going to hide. He obtained permission from the seminary rector and marched to meet the bandits alone. One of the vicious rogues had nabbed a young lady and was dragging her away. St. Gabriel swiftly grabbed a pistol from the bandit and held him at gunpoint, commanding the release of the poor woman. She was released, but it was still Gabriel against 20 armed men. All of a sudden, a lizard was seen a distance away. With one shot, St. Gabriel gunned the lizard down. The bandits quickly lost their courage. The saint ordered them to put down their arms and extinguish the fires they had lit throughout the village. Once they complied, he marched them out of town. Now, during his time of study in Isola, the initial symptoms of consumption began to appear. Gabriel, who had prayed for a slow death so that he could adequately prepare himself, was resigned and even cheerful. His superiors released him from the more rigorous spiritual exercises, such as certain fasts or rising at midnight. However, in 1861, the disease took its final fatal toll. His superior approached him and said plainly that, unless he were granted a miracle, he would definitely die. Gabriel received this news with great joy. Soon, he had to lie on his bed to await death. On the 26th of February, 1862, it seemed that the devil was making his last attempts on Gabriel. Gabriel's spiritual director, Father Norbert, all of a sudden heard him cry out, Vulneratua merita tu mea, thy wounds, O Lord, are my merits. He thought nothing of this, since Gabriel was apt to make expressions like this. But then he suddenly cried out louder, twice, Vulneratua merita mea, thy wounds, O Lord, are my merits. Are you tempted? asked Father Norbert. Yes, Father, I am. With presumption or despair? Presumption, he replied. Father Norbert sprinkled the room with holy water, and he became calm. But then, a short time later, he cried out, How do women enter here? They mustn't be here. Who let them here? O oh, Mary, my mother, chase them away. Make them go. Father Norbert again applied holy water, and the demons departed, but only for a short time. Soon after, Gabriel cried out again, How could that lady get in here? They are not allowed here. Why did you let her in? Chase her out right away. O oh, Mary, my mother, my lady, drive her away. This was the devil's final assault, and it failed. The impure demons were driven away. The 
Three times the devil assaulted him with various temptations, but to no avail. The next day, after receiving absolution from his spiritual director, he took a small image of the sorrowful mother that he loved and pressed it to his bosom. Then, with a loving and confident voice, cried, Oh, my mother, make haste. And then, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, assist me in my last agony. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, may I breathe forth my soul in peace with you. Then, with a serene countenance, he passed from this earth on February 27th, 1862. St. Gabriel's life is truly impressive. Few have made so much spiritual progress in so little time, namely five years and seven months in holy religion. But what was it that gave St. Gabriel the ability to make such rapid progress in his spiritual life? Although he excelled at every virtue, and we could discuss many things, three qualities particularly stand out in the life of this young saint. His humility, his devotion to the passion of Christ, and his love for the Virgin Mary. St. Gabriel's humility was without parallel. He knew the necessity of this virtue, since the holy founder of the Passionist said, one grain of pride will cause a mountain of sanctity to crumble. St. Gabriel was determined to combat the pride that had tormented him in the world. In his book of resolutions, he wrote, I will not utter a word that might in the least turn to my praise. And also, I will not take pleasure in any praise bestowed upon me. On the contrary, I will despise it as bestowed upon one who does not deserve it. I will consider everyone as my superior, not merely in theory, but in practice, treating all with humility and reverence. Father Norbert, who, as we mentioned, was St. Gabriel's spiritual director, attests that he practiced humility to a high degree. He distrusted self, relied on the providence of God for everything, saw himself as a weak and helpless creature, but maintained an unqualified trust in the merciful God. He loved to work menial jobs and said, Our perfection does not consist in doing extraordinary things, but in doing the ordinary well. Once he made a patch that the passionists wore on their habit, much like the shield we have on our fascias. It was a beautiful piece. However, he insisted on switching his patch with another religious, lest his own beautiful piece tempt him to pride. His devotion to the passion of Jesus Christ, obviously a necessity in an order like the passionists, was truly extraordinary. His spiritual director wrote of him, The passion was the ordinary subject of Gabriel's meditations, but he did not rest satisfied with a few superficial considerations and affections. He entered into it in such a manner as to be penetrated with the reasons for which Jesus suffered and died, investing himself with his sentiments and motives, especially his infinite love, and to render these meditations practically useful. He used in particular, he considered in particular, those virtues of which our suffering, our suffering Lord gives us. These he carried away in his heart, kept them continually before his mind, and tried to incorporate them into his daily life. St. Gabriel could truly say with St. Paul, I judged not myself to know anything among you, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Finally, what one of his biographers calls the largest ingredient and the master key of his spiritual life was his devotion to Our Lady. Again, the founder of the Passionists asked his confreres to entertain a pious and ardent devotion toward the Immaculate Virgin Mother of God. Two books, The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguori and The Love of Mary by Dom Roberto, a Commodalese hermit, inflamed him with love for Mary. One of his confreres said of him, Gabriel's heart became a furnace of love toward the Queen of Heaven. His mind was in a manner transformed into Mary, so that he could no longer speak, nor think, nor act, without having her present 
before his mind. He followed St. Bernard's advice. Let the sweet name of Mary be ever on your lips and ever in your heart with scrupulous exactitude. He was particularly drawn to devotion to Mary as the mother of sorrows. This is logical for a true lover of Mary, because when we invoke Our Lady under the title of perpetual help or Our Lady of Mercy, we often act more for ourselves than for Our Lady. But when we venerate her as the mother of sorrows, we act like St. Gabriel Pacenti. We forget self and think of her sorrowful heart. His zeal for Our Lady was unmatched. In fact, he used every opportunity in his power to make her known and loved. He desired even to take another vow in addition to those of poverty, chastity, and obedience to promote devotion to Our Lady as much as he was able. At first, his superiors did not grant this. But since Gabriel proved his devotion to Mary beyond any reasonable doubt, he was finally allowed. In 1861, he formally vowed to be Our Lady's champion for life. This he did, his director wrote, to the unspeakable joy of his heart and to the great profit of his soul. And Our Lady gratefully rewarded her son by granting him this grace. After he took his vow, he never again committed the least deliberate imperfection or fault for the rest of his life. When we look at the life of St. Gabriel Pacenti, we see the true portrait of a saint, his humility, his devotion to the passion, and his devotion to Our Lady brought him to the heights of union with God. He was a man of God, a true man. St. Gabriel Pacenti of the Sorrowful Mother, pray for us.